Welcome to another episode of Science Like Me. I'm your host, Sara Naderi, and joining me today is Ian Ma. Ian is an assistant professor at the Halagiolu Data Science Institute and an affiliated faculty member at the Computer Science and Engineering Department of UC San Diego. Prior to UCSD, Ian spent a year as a visiting faculty at Google Research. Before that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at EECS UC Berkeley. Ian completed his PhD at University of Washington and obtained his bachelor's degree at Shanghai Zhao Tong University. His current research primarily revolves around scalable inference methods for credible machine learning. This involves designing Bayesian inference methods to quantify uncertainty in the predictions of complex models, understanding computational and statistical guarantees of inference algorithms, and leveraging these scalable algorithms to learn from time series data and perform sequential decision-making tasks. That was a mouthful. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Sara. Awesome, so tell me, um, that was a lot that I just said. What does that, can you, can you share with me what that actually means? What do you do? Sounds good. Um, so there are a couple keywords, I guess, in what you said. One is about credible credibility of machine learning models, especially large machine learning models that are being deployed nowadays. Another is about decision making. So uh, let's maybe get into I, uh, both pieces. So in terms of credibility, um, so nowadays we have huge models, huge scale models that um, generate interesting um, outputs. But the question is, a lot of times uh, people are using it or sometimes abusing it um, because they don't know how credible those generated answers are. For example, my neighbor is an attorney and he said once that one of his clients came up to him and said, I don't believe what you said to me because ChatGPT told me otherwise. <laughs> now, this is the classical example of misuse of some of the you know, uh, answers that those large models generated. Um, so to actually facilitate people to make use of them and make decisions, we really need to understand how credible those answers are. So that's part of the, what I'm working on. Another part is given those credibility measures and those predictions and generate the answers, how do, you make use, how do you actually make use of them and make decisions? Especially if you're making decisions in a sequence, you can choose to learn the model well, you can choose to improve the models, or you can start to leverage your knowledge about the model. Sometimes the two tasks are contradictory to each other. How do you balance the two? So let's talk about the credibility for first. Because I would imagine um, if you're creating some sort of model that, uh, that you want to know how credible its output is, is that adding another layer of complexity or, I don't know, math or work involved in, in generating that kind of product, if you will? That's exactly what we're trying to address. So obviously for those huge models, you don't want to constantly retrain it, adding too much on top of it. Right? But at the same time, you also want to quantify not just the so-called aleatoric uncertainty, basically saying, given the model, how much uncertainty the output is, you also want to understand what's the model uncertainty. What's the uncertainty of this learned model, right, given random data? There's always randomness in the data set. Then in that case, how do you do this in a scalable way? Right? One way to do it is to basically every time you get a new data, you retrain the model and then look at how much uncertainty the model is getting by injecting different data and with different noise. Uh, but that's not very efficient. So what we are looking at is are there ways to avoid doing that um, to still be able to achieve the credibility measure that we want to get? Um, and at the same time, doesn't decrease the, the prediction accuracy by too much. How would you do that? So I guess in this scenario, would this be a, a use case? So I'm using ChatGPT to help me write uh, code or solve a math problem, let's right. say. And I've realized, especially recently, that there's a certain point in which it can't do a very good job of solving these math problems. But if I didn't know any better, I would not have realized that it was making those kinds of mistakes. So with the credibility addition to it, it would, would it then output like, hey, this is the answer that I'm giving you, but understand that I'm 75% sure this is right. Right, exactly. So basically take it a, with a grain of salt if it's only maybe 50, 40% sure. confidence. Um, and when it's relatively high confidence, it will say that you know, based on my knowledge that I accumulated, um, this will likely be the right answer. So why doesn't it do that now? 
<laughs> um, yeah, so this is actually, if you listen to some of the OpenAI people talking about it, they recognize this is the, one of the greatest challenges um, ChatGPT is facing. Um, right, and so there are a couple ways to, to tackle this. One way is to say, okay, so I want to generate a slew of models um, w with respect to you know, certain perturbations in the model structure, architecture, and then what would the output become? What's the distribution of the output? Um, and another way is to say, okay, I build sort of a discriminator um, on top of that. Say that ChatGPT generates interesting answers, but I'm going to have another system vetting those answers. Yeah. And then if, um, let's say, the, the, the discriminator is certain that this is true or wrong, or false or true, then they'll be able to just tell, okay, so the model is probably, so I'm relatively certain about those outputs. But when it's really in the middle, then ChatGPT's answer might be a good hypothesis to test. So then I can improve this sort of vetting procedure, this discriminator model, yeah. and then query, let's say, the world or experts um, and improve this kind of discriminator. That's another way to do this. Is the reason why something like this isn't already existing because people haven't figured out how to create these credibility, I don't know, would you call it models or algorithms? And uh, or is it the fact that it is actually computationally expensive to do? The m majority of our problem is it's computationally expensive. Okay. Um, so the question is, how do we reduce mm -hmm. computation complexity? And that's part of the, what we are working on. I've been taking this machine learning class recently, and I've come to realize that there are a lot of times that the decision is based on computational power and not necessarily like the theory of how to do it. Um, and it's interesting because it's like a suddenly you're forced to make these practical decisions that you're like, but ideally we would do it this other way. But um, it's an interesting factor in, in, I don't know, coming up with these models, if you will. In terms of theoretical understanding, yes. So this is a ex additional avenue of consideration. So basically now, previously, we're usually looking at the bias variance trade-off, basically a trade-off between so the how large you can make the model cost be um, versus so the how much uncertainty there is associated with the larger model class. Now we also have a computational consideration. So now the trade-off becomes even more complicated. And that's also what's going on in the theory community, trying to understand this trade-off among so the extra factor. Yeah. If, there's, uh, if quantum computing becomes a thing, would that, n would that not be a consideration anymore? Quantum computing can help in certain avenues, but um, it doesn't really help for everything. So, so there is this computation hardness notion of um, sort of whether it can be polynomially solved or whether it's exponentially hard. Uh, there is another notion is that whether it can be polynomially solved if you have a quantum computer, it doesn't so cover everything. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives you a sli slightly bigger cost of problems that it can be solved in polynomial time but it doesn't solve all the exponentially time uh, problems. Nice. That's, that's actually reassuring it, in a way, right? Because it's like, oh, there's not going to be this kind of machine that knows how to do everything. <laughs> I don't know why that terrifies me, but it kind of does. Um, OK, so you were talking about the, the credibility portion, and then you were talking about, um, and I forgot already, what was the other one? Um, that was the decision making. Part. The decision making. And is that, and how do you contribute in that space? So the one question is, OK, so you have your predictions and you have uncertainty measures associated with your predictions, how to make use of it. For example, in um, so the medical applications, um, so you might want to shun away from those predictions you're not so sure about. You might not want to recommend doctors to take those actions that you don't know exactly what the outcome would be. But in some cases, um, for example, in cases of recommendation systems, you might want to explore more. So um, if, especially if you're making those decisions in sequence, you might want to explore those actions that you haven't taken before to see what the viewer response would be so that you get a better sense of, oh, are there items, uh, are those the items I really want to uh, recommend to the users? Um, so that's one, th the one part of the avenue that uh, we're working on and trying to understand better. Um, there is also this middle ground where um, so it's not just you're recommending things to people, which is what machine learning traditionally has been working the best. There might be also a question of 
Um, so what if I want to use my algorithm to determine the price of certain items or determine the, the sort of coupons I want to give out to people? Then in those cases, um, you might not just want to use vanilla like exploration, exploitation trade off those algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms. You might want to, from the beginning, you might want to start making some more informed decisions mm -hmm. and mix your past experience with this exploration strategy. So things become a little bit more complicated that way. Because I know a lot of companies are trying to use just apply reinforcement learning for a lot of things like pricing strategies, logistics. But the problem is they start losing money very quickly. Yeah. The question is, how do you do that in a smart way without having to lose money a lot in the beginning, but at the same time, you explore options and optimize them uh, later on? So when you say uh, using your past experience to like inform the d decision making, are you are you saying like the individual who is using the system or training the system is going to provide their personal insight into this system? That may be one source, but maybe a bigger source is you c they can look at the you know other companies' sales, for example. Okay. Right. So what kind of price would associate to what kind of sales? Right. You, basically, it's a it's a problem of you want to maximize. The, the price times the volume of sales. So you can look at the past experience from other companies, from other products even, and borrow those information for your use. Um, in those cases, of course, the problem is there is so-called a distribution shift. So the, the items you see, uh, you sell or the platform you use might be different. Mm -hmm. So the users group might also be different. So the dis user distributions and the item distribution might be a little different. You want to calibrate for that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, make use of the information you have at hand. So it's interesting that you shared that because I would have imagined that that would have already been the standard way of doing it. So is the standard way of doing it that a company would only use their own data and that's the kind of reinforcement learning that they're trying to do and then you're sharing that like a better model or a more accurate model would be including these other kinds of data sets to kind of i don't know enhance its decisions um so th as far as i know um a lot of companies previously were making up the price first of all uh, manually mm. um, when they don't have a lot of items and they accumulate experience in making up those uh, prices and then uh, later on, the companies are tr comparing prices against other companies so that they get comparative advantage. And then, more recently, they're trying to say that I want to move away from this. I want to do reinforcement learning to better sort of maximize my profit margin. Um, and they actually lost a lot of money because of that. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah. There are, yeah, there, there are definitely smarter ways of doing that. But I'm just kind of curious, like, why would it have failed so hard? Like, why? W I would have imagined it would have at least been on par, maybe even a little bit better. Um, one explanation is um, if you just naively deploy the reinforcement learning methods, then you need to at least explore each item. So if you are giving out coupons, then you need to explore item and customer pairs, or item group of per customer pairs. Sure. That's a lot of items to go through. Mm -hmm. So if you just explore all those items uniformly, you're losing a lot of money, right? Because you're just assume, uh, giving out sort of random perturbation to the prices to each item, right, yeah. associated to each user group. Is it that the concept of reinforcement learning wasn't necessarily a good approach, or the people using it didn't use it in the best way? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's basically the, whether they're, like, they have used it in a smart way. Yeah. If you just use vanilla system that's out there, it's not going to be very efficient. I would imagine that's actually probably, um, unfortunately, not that uncommon, where people just kind of throw an algorithm at it and be like, yeah, it looks decent. Let's just go with it. <laughs> that's what happens a lot. Yeah. Um, it's. I don't know if this is relevant either, but I um, I had to do some I had to create a model that will predict stock prices, and it only used previous data to to create this model. But why not add other avenues of like you know uh, news articles and uh, you know even social media comments about these companies and like try to aggregate all that kind of information and combine it with historical data to see if you can make a better predicting model. People are doing that. Oh, okay. Large companies are doing that. Nice. 
Well, that so, makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, basically, the, the sort of a new source of the data that they consider um, and the avenue they consider exciting for researchers inside of those trading companies are actually in those directions. OK. Yeah, it would make more sense, I would think, because especially since it's not like, uh, unfortunately, stock prices are reflective of the actual production of the company. To, to some extent. Yeah, it, but it's mostly how people feel, I think. That's what makes it so unpredictable. I also want to know two other things. One is how this applies to TELOS, the Institute of Learning Optimization, Learning, Learning Enabled, Enabled Optimization, Optimization at Scale. I think you've already alluded to it earlier with the medical case scenario, but really kind of talking me through the pipeline of like what your research is and then how that eventually turns into something that is tangible in terms of a product for a person. In terms of connection to Telos, um, so it is about optimization, and it is about learning enabling the optimization, and this is exactly what the sequential decision making or reinforcement learning is trying to achieve. And in terms of, I guess, exciting new areas um, with respect to Telos and with respect and overall in terms of the, um, both in terms of the theory and in terms of application, what we're considering is, um, so let's say that you have, you are able to calibrate certain models about predictions. You're able to release those as a policy maker. Uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, so assuming that um, people are sort of, uh, each are sort of strategic agents. They're playing a game against each other. Um, giving them some more information, the hope is that they can better collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, but there are cases where um, giving out a signal might make people less efficient in collaborating. For example, um, so one concrete example we're working on is for epidemiology prediction. Um, so in that case, what we are working towards is, um, so during the pandemic, we were making predictions about the potential outbreak hotspots uh, ho um, are. Um, and then using those predictions to inform people of how to allocate the resource. Um, but now, uh, now we're doing it for the flu pandemic, uh, epidemic and so forth. Um, so, but one concern is once we can make predictions maybe for a month to two months ahead of time, the uncertainty level will be large, um, but the prediction might say that there might be a huge spike in certain area. Um, if you just release that information uh, without any vetting, uh, any calibration, people might start hoarding medical equipments. This might become worse for the entire community. Mm -hmm. This might even become a self-fulfilling prophecy that originally it wouldn't be as bad, but once you made that prediction, it's becoming worse. Yeah, yeah. So then how to take that into account when releasing information to facilitate decision making? Right? That's one avenue of research. And it's also related to how do you do optimization in this complicated scenario. What kind of data is available to use to make that kind of determination? CDC always keeps those data. Oh, really? About, about each area, each local area, what are the case numbers, and how serious those are ca the cases, and what are the strains of flu. That I, I understand, but I guess what I'm asking is like when somebody makes an announcement, do there, is there also data showing like, you know, suddenly people were hoarding medical supplies or things like that? Like, is there that kind of? Yeah, that kind of information usually is secondhand. So usually we don't have ex um, direct data about people hoarding medical equipment and so forth. But usually we do have data about to, to facilitate us in making predictions about the outbreak uh, hotspots. Um, so those are the predictions we can make. Yeah. And in some of those cases, um, if re the prediction is not very certain and if it's radical, you might want to dial it down, right? We might, might want to say, because we're not so sure about those predictions, maybe we should just release information about the parts we are sh more certain about. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like it's trying to think of as many layers as possible in terms of like what would influence the actual output of something. And so it seems like for the most part, the way people operate in this air, in this space, might not be taking in as many layers as they should necessarily to try to optimize their output. So I, I just like the the if I'm understanding it correctly, the idea of like factoring in how people would react with this information in terms of like how to actually end up benefiting society. Where does it play in the pipeline? Right. So. Um 
Yeah, so some of my s students and I were working on more theoretical grounded problems. For example, um, you can abstract the previous problem about um, sort of releasing information into the following one. Um, so consider people, let's say, playing in a game. They have their own utilities, uh, which depends on their own actions and other people's actions. Um, then if they don't coordinate, if they, they don't have a signal, how the, are they going to play it, right? They, they would converge to something called a Nash equilibrium. Uh, so basically everybody looking for their own best interest. But you know, there are a lot of shared interests across the board. If you release a signal, how can we turn this selfish Nash equilibrium into a more correlated equilibrium, which co help people coordinate? Um, so that's, on a theoretical level, that's an interesting question. And then, um, on the more applied problems, um, so like I said, we were working on this uh, sort of flu loop epidemic prediction system and giving uncertainty quantification associated with the predictions. Um, and then, I guess the next step is to look at um, sort of how, whether there are sort of optimal strategies for releasing those informations. Um, so yeah, so the, I guess we are working on sort of both the more theoretical parts and the more applied parts. I'm curious, uh, as you were sharing that, uh, do you guys work with um, psychologists or uh, cognitive science? Cognitive science. There you go. Do you work with any uh, those groups when trying to figure out like how to create uh, signals that would make people work together, or was that just an analogy of like? Right. Uh, so not yet, but I do know there are faculties at UCSD which look at those cases. Um, so uh, that are in cognitive science department. Um, so the idea is that um, so currently what we are doing is we are making this uh, assumption that people are being rational. Okay. So people are optimizing their own gains. But yes, um, cogn cogn in terms of cognitive science, people might not react that way. And then the uh, cognitive scientists, they're trying to figure out what exactly do people react to. They are drawing analogy to reinforcement learning systems and so forth, actually. Um, for example, you can model it as people don't have the complete information. Then from a sort of um, global perspective, they're not reacting optimally. But in fact, it's because conditioning on the information you have you may be actually reacting pretty um, sort of smart. When did you know you wanted to go down this path of computer science and uh, data science? Oh, um, so exactly this path, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it might change, right? I sure. might work on different things. Um, but yeah, the, the talk about my childhood isn't particularly interesting, but um, I was born and raised in Shanghai. And um, so in China, this, this education system is very exam oriented. So you get a lot of exercises to prepare you for the exams. I was always trying to find creative ways to avoid <laughs> doing some of the practi you know, practices that I don't deem interesting. Uh, I played a lot of soccer. Um, and uh, yeah, to this day, I still feel it was smart to do that. Um, and that also helped me becoming a little bit more creative in thinking about things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, um, I don't necessarily appreciate uh, so many exercises thrown at me, but I think that period of time also helped me become more flexible. Yeah. So that's funny. That's cool. I feel like um, a lot of people could relate to that. They don't want to do something, so they find a creative way of doing it because um, they still have to do it, right? So um, not quite. Okay, maybe not. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I I did uh, some physics Olympics to avoid doing those other homework and stuff. Yeah, you said physics Olympics. Yeah, so th that was a thing, I guess, in uh, high school and middle school. And then the pe basically people who did those can avoid doing some of the homework. Oh wow! Well, that's kind <laughs> that's, of fun. That's though. what I did. Yeah, that's kind <laughs> yeah. of yeah. Okay. In college, there is this mandatory training of for I don't know military training or something. So I did another competition to get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so uh, my next question will be more forward looking. What are you most excited about moving forward? We're working on this project um, for extreme climate prediction. So we're trying to understand what, where would extreme climate appear going forward, because the climate is changing. Um, so one way to do this is to, um, so the space of 
hypothesis is large, it's huge. So how do you efficiently explore that? Um, for example, what does extreme weather mean? Or what does um, sort of unpredictable weather mean? That's very ambiguous. Um, that's where those language models, large language models, can help. So essentially, they can generate those hypotheses uh, in an interesting way. And then we can have this discriminator, as we described, to vet, essentially, are some of the hypotheses already learnable? Um, and the ones that are really unlearn not learnable, th those are interesting hypotheses. And then we'll just zoom in on those areas and, and test those hypotheses. Um, so sometimes it's really unpredictable. Then those might be regions of high risk. Hmm. Um, and down the pipeline, we might be able to inform the agriculture departments, basically saying there are you know, potentially dangerous or unpredictable spots popping up. And some of the spots are relatively safe. And then if you want to release information, that goes back into this sort of uh, uh, multi-agent uh, game scenario, where you may not just want to release a few of those spots that you're particularly sure that they're going to be safe, because then that creates a congestion. People want to all buy into those land. Right? You might want to say, OK, give it some uh, the benefit of the doubt, saying those are a large chunk of the areas might be relatively safe, but there are particular spots that may be concerning. What's to prevent somebody from creating their own models of the same thing so that they don't have to worry about somebody deciding what information they're allowed to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not trying to control information, per se. What we're trying to do is to say, if we have some really low confidence in something, do we actually release them? Sure. Right? In some cases, it's beneficial to release them. In some cases, it's not very beneficial. It just creates confusion and panic. In those cases, we basically would not release it. People can still train their own model. Yeah, um, yeah the, but when they train it, hopefully they'll realize. Th so th there is this credibility issue. And then when they actually take those into account, they do it with a grain of salt. You said extreme weather is not, uh, is, is not predictable necessarily. But I feel like you said something about it also not being, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood, like well-defined uh, either. So yeah, what does unpredictable weather mean? Yeah. Is that, so that's not like a consensus of like, you know, if it does X, Y, Z, it may, meets this threshold and therefore it's classified as that? Like it's, it's also ambiguous in how it's defined? It's very um, ambiguous. Huh. So the way to do it is to say, okay, I can, I can try to learn about the weather pattern going forward. But sometimes there is this just intrinsic uncertainty that's, that can all be learned, right? Um, then we can label them as unpredictable. The problem is the space is so large. Right? How do you traverse this space? One way to do it is to incorporate you know, previously learned knowledge in, let's say, large language models to generate those hypotheses. So in those cases, you don't care so much about how credible those generated hypotheses are, because you're going to test them anyway. As long as they are doing it in an interesting way, um, that, that already help. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Sora, for having me here. Great, and uh, that's another episode of Science Like Me.